now for quite a few years. We um, are starting a sub mini series that we're calling personal vignettes for dismantling racism. And so this idea came out of consultation with a few friends and I thought it was a really great idea to do that. And so the goal of this mini series is really to have conversations with individuals about their personal learning journey as they strive to understand the meaning of racial justice and oneness of humanity and their actual place in it. And so as we will explore um, with our first guest that I wanna welcome, Dr. Hoda Hosini, um, we wanna explore with them the knowledge uh, that is transforming their personal lives and also the lives of the friends around them and in their community. And so please join me really in welcoming um, Dr. Hosini and <laughs> um, she is a loved one by many people all over around the country. And so I thought it would be a really great way to um, learn from her as we engage in anti-Black racism work. So a little bit about Dr. Hosseini. What I just wanted to share is that she um, was born in Iran and then moved to the UK as a teen. And she's lived in the US since 1983. She's married, she's a, she's a mother of two children and has two grandchildren. Um, she has a private practice in Florida as a general and cosmetic dentist since uh, 1988. She also co-founded the Broward County Institute for Healing Racism in 1991 and is an avid promoter of racial justice and the oneness of humanity. <clears throat> so please join me in welcoming her. And the one thing that I wanted to say is that I'm just feeling very grateful and I wanna thank her for being here because um, it's not every day that we have the opportunity to hear somebody's story. And I just want to honor the courage and the vulnerability that it takes to uh, be in a space and to share our story in such a way. And so thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> and so um, the first thing I wanted to do is to um, talk about what Shoghi Effendi tells us. So as you see, as you saw in the first quote, Shoghi Effendi tells us that the path towards the elimination of racial prejudice is long and thorny and beset with pitfalls. And so the overarching theme that we would like us to talk about today um, is the, is Hoda's journey towards anti-Black racism on this long and thorny road um, and how it has transformed her personal life and motivated her to engage with others. And so as we have the conversation, the way we're going to do it is not going to be a presentation, but it's going to be a conversation uh, similar to an interview for a while, <laughs> just really having a conversation. And then we're going to open it up to the friends so that they can also add share uh, what is inspiring about her story and then ask her also follow-up questions. And so that's how it's going to uh, work. And so um, the first question, I don't know, Hoda, um, I'm going to highlight you. I'm not exactly sure how to do that. Do I just, <laughs> no, we, we need to be able to see you. Uh, hold on, spotlight, yes. All right, um, should I spotlight myself as well since we're having a conversation? No, uh, 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 this is great. <laughs> Would you like me to spotlight myself as well? Hoda? Okay, all right, this will be great. Um, all right, so welcome Hoda uh, and I would like to start with one question, which is um, how has your journey towards anti-Black racism inspired you? So meaning what has inspired your work towards anti-Black racism? First of all, I wanna say hello and alapa to everybody who's here. And I am actually really speechless right now 
because what I see on the screen and the names on the screen are many who have told me everything that I know. People, individuals, souls who have taught me, the people of the eye, people of African descent, except Dell, I mean, except Chuck Edgerton, he is the anomaly here, a dear friend. Um, the people of the eye who taught me everything that I know. And it's a very strange space for me to be the speaking because this is not what I'm interested in. I'm more interested in hearing the voice of the people of the eye. And my work is to center the people of the eye and make sure that I um, empower, encourage, make spaces available so their voices are heard. So it's a little odd being here. So I just wanted to first acknowledge those of you who are especially here who've been great mentors to me and friends to me. And um, I've already <clears throat> mentioned uh, Chuck and I'm going down and I see, uh, I see Bob James, I see Karen Anderson, I see Cherry Steinwender, my dear, dear, dear mentor and friend. I see Del Campbell, who I love like a brother and is always a rock. And I see Terry Tabesh. I see, um, I see Barbara Talley. Barbara, I'm so glad you're here. Oh my God, I see Masood here. What am I doing talking? It just makes no sense. but. Um, since it was designed, thank you for being here. I really am. I'm at a loss for there's nothing that I can say that has any worth or value. Um, everything. Um, ah, all right. So you asked me a question what has inspired me and motivated me? I want to share a little bit about my spiritual ancestry. If you could just, I just have three slides. Um, uh, the, the first is my uh, Jewish ancestors who became Baha'is. Um, this is at the turn of the century in, 19, in the early 1900s. And they were very ordinary, very poor Jews who lived on the outskirts of the city of Kashan. And there he is Eliyahu and his sons, uh, Dawud and Sha'aban. And um, they were attracted to the message of Baha'u'llah and they um, upset the equilibrium in the family. They actually found each other in a Baha'i fireside and they were shocked that they were all had been and become interested because everything was just secret. Nobody would openly um, share with others. It was a very small net Jewish community. They were very poor and they became Baha'is and the light of Baha'u'llah's revelation moved their heart with their pivotal principle being the oneness of humanity. And they were really persecuted, not just by you know, the, um, the time in which they lived because they were untouchable and fiddles. They were, um, had to live in their cage. They were deject caves on the outskirts of the city of Kashan because they were dejected and because they were Jews. And it was the early Baha'is, these Iranian early Baha'is who went to cave to cave teaching and they shared the message of Baha'u'llah with them. And subsequently they became Baha'is. So the next picture is of my uh, father's or paternal ancestry, Sheikh Ali Yazdi, and his two brothers who also became Baha'is. This is a picture taken circa 1870. I don't know um, if that's what it says at the bottom. And Sheikh Ali Yazdi uh, um, was an early Babi and he uh, later was so persecuted because he was a Sheikh, he was a Muslim Mullah and he walked on foot and he eventually went to the Sudan and later on to Egypt and again, very much persecuted. My uh, great grandfather, Abu Ghassan Gulistani, and Muhammad Azza Gulistani, his son, my grandfather, um, were stoned out of the city of Shiraz, the pivotal principle for which they 
um, they took all, they bared all those um, difficulties was because they believed in the oneness of humanity. And the last slide I just want to show you, this is the woman who empowers and inspires me the most. She's my mom's cousin, who I refer to as Auntie Shidroch. And she was um, taken with the nine members of the Spiritual Assemblies of the Baha'is of Tehran. And they took her to prison in later on, late 1980. They tortured with a hot iron on her breast. They beat her so bad on her foot that she had to walk on her knees the last six months of her life. And before they put a gun to her head and they said, they always say, what is the goal of the Baha'i faith? Because they want you to write down and say, I'm not a Baha'i. They torture you, hoping that you would recant your faith. And she never did, although she had three beautiful children. They asked her, what is the goal of the Baha'i faith? And before they shot her, she says, to promote the oneness of humanity. So this, thank you, um, these are all the slides and these are the people who have inspired me the most. This is my spiritual inheritance. And um, I guess, do you have a next question? Yes. Okay. Did it stop sharing? Sorry, I was having. Thank you so much for sharing um, your inspiration in terms of um, what inspires you towards working towards the oneness of humanity and how that connects. Um, and hopefully we're going to explore how that connects to our work um, and your work specifically on your path to anti-Black racism and eliminating racial uh, prejudice. And so what I wanted to ask you uh, if you could share would be one of the first experiences where you realized that racism existed and how it contradicted your understanding of the oneness of humanity. Um, I was only nine years old. That's my first time I really got a major cognitive dissonance. Uh, my, I love my father greatly. He was a wonderful Baha'i. He uh, taught the Baha'i faith. I remember him kneeling, saying his obligatory prayers. And just a wonderful, he we would always have behind meetings and youth gatherings and children classes at our home. And, you know, Encyclopedia Britannica, my father was very, as a scientist, he was born and raised in Egypt. And um, he, like most Iranians, wanted one of his, at least one of his daughters, and this for us, to become doctors. <laughs> so <laughs> he, he um, was showing me the Encyclopedia Britannica and then he came to the section, you know, the transparencies of the layer after layer of the human body. And I said, oh my God, dad, that tells me we're all the same under the skin. We're all one, we're all one human family. And look, these different layers of, of the human body. And he says, yes, Shida, we're all members of the one human race, but you can never marry a black man. So this in the mind of a young girl who has been bought, who has been brought up, has been taught the central principle of the oneness of humanity. Oh, a Baha'i who I, who's my first Baha'i teacher, as well as my mom, who's an amazing Baha'i historian and artist who's written nine books on the history of the Baha'i faith. For him to say this created great cognitive dissonance and I didn't ask anything, but it just stayed with me. And later on, my father and I, we would have great conversations. And he motivated me to do this work because he was brought up and raised in Egypt. And when he was young, he was indoctrinated with a fallacious doctrine of white superiority um, in, the, in the work of science uh, and the racial superiority of whites and blacks at the bottom. And all his life, he struggled against this inherent and this, in, um, this learned, learned study, fake pseudoscience of the myth of white superiority. And he always encouraged me to study the scientific proofs of the oneness of humanity. Abdul Baha says, seek the realities underlying the oneness of humanity and discover the source of fellowship, which will unite humanity and the heavenly bond of love. So I, later on in my life, I started 
really focusing on understanding and sharing and discovering and searching all branches of science that prove the essential oneness of the human race. So I am, in a way, I am indebted to him because his struggle, you know, his struggle became also my struggle. Thank you for sharing that story. It takes a lot of courage <clears throat> as we engage in these discussions to talk about our families and the learning that we have been able to engage in as we experience um, the life struggles of, of every single human being on this planet and how it has helped you to grow and evolve. And so with that in mind, um, I was wondering if you could also share with us a little bit about, um, so you, you experienced <clears throat> anti-Black racism as your nine-year-old and you moved to where um, you attended school. And then after that, you moved to the US. And so I was wondering if you could share with us a little bit about um, your experience, what some of your first experiences uh, with regards to anti-Black racism in the United States. Um, and maybe if you, I don't know if you wanna contrast it with other experiences, but just getting an idea of what that was like for you. Um, as an immigrant arriving in this country? Well, um, every immigrant that comes to the US has a story. They ask us and we will tell you exactly what our experience are the first day that we arrived to the United States, the first day that we step here. But um, this is not, uh, this. I came here first visited when I was 18. And uh, this is in 1978, before the, um, the uh, Iranian revolution. Uh, we came here, our family arrived here and um, I'll never forget this. This is the first, which really sets the stage for why I am so determined to be engaged as an Iranian American immigrant to to strive hard to heal the rac racial divide because racism is the enemy of oneness of humanity. Racism is the enemy of the oneness of humanity. So when I first arrived, um, we arrived in New York with my family and um, it was at night and my uh, cousin who had a, beautiful white Rolls Royce in the city of New York, picked us up from the airport. And he drove us around. He said, I want to show you, show you New York. And I, I was like flabbergasted. My jaw dropped. I was like amazed. And I wasn't like from the back streets from any kind of, you know, uh, country. I had just come from England, but I still was like these huge skyscrapers and this that took all the way that went up to the highest spaces and the moon was full. I'll never forget it. And I hung low and he drove us around through Central Park, Fifth Avenue, um, you know, all these beautiful streets in Manhattan and showed me, showed us all these beautiful places. And like, I was so excited as a young woman. I said, wow, this is America is beautiful. And in my mind is America, the land of, liberty, justice, equality for all. This is what I've been taught, you know. I've always thought of America as this haven for people of all backgrounds, of all people. And all of a sudden he made a wrong turn and I just noticed that he, uh, he got really nervous. I could literally see the sweat on his forehead and he just got really anxious and he just, um, he kind of got a little edgy and he was angry and he was uncomfortable and he said just everybody keep your head down don't look up keep your head down we're a dangerous area don't look and then me being a very inquisitive young woman I looked up and everybody I saw was African-American so right away I realized there are two Americas one white one black separate unequal and hostile and if I were to be safe, if I were to make it, if I were to be treated as an equal, if I was going to be living in the street, have everything paved with gold and, and have the American dream, I had 
the choice. I had to make the choice. But honestly, it just didn't settle at all with me. It was like a disgusting, noxious, poisonous drink that was offered to me at the tarmac of this, my first entrance to America. And I didn't want to swallow it. It was disgusting. I wanted to bring it up, just vomit it, because it just did not sit right with me, because it was opposite everything I had ever believed. Wow, that's a really powerful story. Can I ask a follow-up question with regards to that? And um, it really has to do with this idea of whiteness. Um, and so thinking about how, um, if you could share with us, because this was the beginnings of you awakening to this idea of whiteness and um, resources and you know where you needed to go, what you needed to do to have access to specific resources. And so maybe if you could share with you how you have with us, how you have experienced whiteness in the United States as an Iranian. And um, also maybe thinking about what does othering look like for you as well? So thinking about these terms, and I don't know if we want to maybe briefly define them for the friends as well. Uh, whiteness really referring not necessarily to white people specifically, but to the ideology that sustains a system of white supremacy in this country. Um, well, I see you kind of, you know, change things around a little bit. I know. <laughs> it connects it's well, okay. It's all right. You know, but the reason I'm, um, yeah, whatever I may share from here on is really because I've been actively listening and I've had deep, meaningful um conversations with people of African descent, Baha'is of African descent, who really help me understand um, this is not because I'm smart or I have anything different than any other immigrant or Iranian that comes to this country. It's no, it's, it's because, um, and my friend Barbara Tally, she shares this, quote often, and I want to share it here before I say anything, study the need of the cause, the need of the cause in America is the call of the heart, not the call of the mind, not the call of anything else, it's the call of the heart, and your heart has got to be pure, you've got to constantly weed out the, the garbage that grows in it, so you can put beautiful with uh, beautiful flowers of love, justice, unity in it, is a call of the heart as it can be given by no one save those who have suffered and been trained in the road of sacrifice and humility. I have not tread, I have not tread the road of sacrifice and humility. I, as an Iranian American who've come to this country, have benefited greatly from this two Americas, one white, one black, separate, unequal, and hostile. America is built on racism. America is built and designed on a caste system of racial hierarchy. The wealth of this country that all immigrants like me come to and benefit from, and even dare have the audacity to look down on people of African descent. The wealth of this country and the modern world that we, that all people all across the world benefit from was built on the backs of millions of stolen people from Africa. And stolen land of people of indigenous background in this country. So first of all, I have to say, you know, when I share things like this, Hoda, you're being an ungrateful immigrant. Hoda, you left your country, you come over here, you're sounding anti-America. Hoda, you're being anti-white. Hoda, you're, you're just not looking at American history correctly. But this country, honestly, and the new racism, which is no racism, we don't, there is no racism. This is the new racism. 
to completely whitewash American history as if none of those things ever happened. To whitewash the American history from, from the beginning, even not even um, admit to the fact that before people were enslaved and brought in chains from Africa and stripped off of everything, their language, their custom, their behavior, their food, their, there were kings, there were queens, they had great civilizations. They had great, they, they had the Mali civilization, the Benin, the wealth of Mansa Musa in the 1319, and, and, and all of this, the, the lies that have been perpetuated from the very beginning, the narrative of whiteness that has been indoctrinated in the minds of millions of people from the very inception of this country. And then the, saying that the founding of America, the founding of America, um, the founding fathers, no, nobody found this. This was already America, native indigenous people lived here. They had great civilizations, they had great language, they had great customs and, and languages and, and cultures. And, um, and the, the, they were these so-called founding fathers they were all racists who announced that all men are created equal and called out for liberty, justice, equality and pursuit of happiness, except for African-Americans, because we know that, you know, everybody, a lot of people of different ethnicities and nationalities before they were white or people were black, people were German, French, um, from somewhere, from Poland, from German, from Ireland, from Italy, they're from, uh, they were Jewish, but it's all this, this whiteness is just an invention. We know it happened in the 17th century. And I didn't know any of this because here I know you asked me to talk about whiteness. Who taught me all this? You know, Abdu'l-Bahá said the peace and tranquility of the world depends on one thing. Even so many Iranians say, look at the situation of the people in Iran. It's so terrible. Why are you talking about that? Why are you talking about what's happening in America? Why are you talking about black and white in America? Well, that issue is also going to be solved. If I believe in Abdu'l-Bahá, he says the peace and tranquility of the world depends on one thing, of coming together of the black and white in America. But in order for that to begin, the language of Negro is for the language in the, in the 1920s. The Guardian says, in order for that to begin, the Negro must be represented. So he may express his viewpoint. So we may understand it. So we may reach across this chasm. And I didn't learn anything because I'm such some kind of a brilliant young woman. No. We're going to get to see, find out my story on how I learned all this. So anyway, um, this systemic racism, again, I, this, I didn't know this. Cherry was the first one that told me about institutionalized racism. Miss Cherry Steinwender, who's here, about how this have and have nots and this racial caste theory has been created with whites on top and blacks on the bottom and me as an immigrant middle that I have to choose if I want to make it I want to be on the top this is the whiteness and at a great cost to my African-American Baha'i brothers and sisters in America so to know that blacks that earn less than 40 percent less than whites right now in America that there's 90 percent more wealth that whites have from intergenerational wealth that the high poverty um, high schools are 72% in black communities and compared to 31% in white communities, that only half um, of, young, of a young black students go to college compared to whites, that they're eight times more likely to be sent to college, not go, not, sorry, eight times more likely for them to be made to go to jail because of the prison industrial complex, because of the, um, prison industrial complex that is designed to house and punish black men and women a lot more than white people. And that 
people of African descent generally have much lower, um, they, they die sooner. They, they, their life is eight to 10 years less than that of white people and people that look like me. So why do I talk about this? Because I don't want to be the hands and arms and the arbiters of white supremacy. I don't want as a person in the middle to have to um, reach out for the American dream while I'm trampling over people of African descent, not hear their story. So anyway, and I know that African Americans know the value of the oneness of humanity. I know because for hundreds of years, for centuries, they've been praying to God, they've been singing to God, they've been longing for the oneness of, of humanity. So um, I'm gonna stop. So maybe you wanna have a next question. Thank you so much. And um, I'm sorry I switched things around on you, okay. <laughs> friends. You know, we had um, quite a few questions and I thought that as she was talking about um, her arrival in America, and North America specifically, and thinking about how she noticed that there were two Americas separate and unequal, I thought it would be interesting for her to talk a little bit about the idea of whiteness and what that looked like for her um, as she arrived in the US. And so the next question, which I think will lead really well into um, what you were talking about is, who have you learned all of this from? Mm -hmm. And so if you could talk about, um, you know, how you shared in the past, how the strong role of black women, the role of black women have had specifically in your life and how they have helped you transform um, your life and the lives of those around you. And so maybe share a few key related moments in your life uh, with regards to these black women. Mm. All right, so I don't want to leave out black men because that would be a travesty. But, you know, it's, you know, women, females, we kind of talk, we can go, we can go deeper into many things. Um, so, uh, Del, if you're here, don't feel left out. I love you very much, my brother. Um, but I just, I just uh, want to share that um, in this favorite, the first, the, uh, the quote that we all know, um, uh, casting away once and for all the fallacious doctrine of racial superiority with all its attendant evils, confusion, and mis miseries. So in my mind, Baha'u'llah, oh, sorry, the guardian, forgive me, Shogi Effendi, he identifies the problem which is the doctrine of white superiority, the fallacious, the crooked, the wrong, the non-spiritual, the man-made doctrine of racial superiority, which was up until the 17th century, there was no mention of race. You know, people also saw each other differently. It was only invented in the 17th century. And then he says, with all its attendant evils, confusion, talk about confusion and miseries. And then he immediately shares and welcoming and encouraging the intermixture of races and tearing down the barriers that now divide them. They should each endeavor day and night to fulfill their particular responsibilities in the common task which so urgently faces them. So from what I understood from this, in order to overcome this fallacious doctrine of white superiority, the superiority, the guardian gives us an immediate answer of what we need to do, that we are so separate. We don't, blacks and whites, we don't live in the same neighborhoods. We don't go to the same schools. We don't shop in the same shopping centers. We don't, we, our grocery stores are racially um, divided. Um, our schools, our places of worship, everything is so separated. It's so segregated, it's abnormal. And the guardian says that we need to tear down, tear down these barriers that come between them. 
And then he also later on, we all know this quote, let the white make a supreme effort. Well, I'm not white. I know I'm not white. America, I may sound white, I may kind of light hair, but I benefit from white privilege. I am white adjacent. I am white presenting. Uh, I am white looking. I sound, I, because I went to school in England, I sound this, and this is really gives me great privilege. So we know this quote, let the white make a supreme effort to abandon once and for all the usually inherent and at times subconscious sense of sobriety to correct their tendency towards revealing a patronizing attitude. I think about these things all the time because of my African-American Baha'i friends have taught me exactly what it looks like. When I say it, they say, oh, hold up. What did you just say? Did you just say what I thought you said? And instead of me saying, oh, I didn't mean to say that. Don't defend yourself. Just you might as well say, you know what? That came, that popped up right out. I apologize. I'm going to do a little bit better. No denial, no minimization, no turning it around, no making, no uh, weaponized Persian fragility. Oh, you made me feel so sad. I'm so upset. You know, don't you know I'm crying? Don't you know I've been, you know, I've had a bad day? No. And then the guardian says to persuade them through their intimate, spontaneous, and informal association with them of the genuineness of their friendship and the sincerity of their intentions. And to master their impatience of any lack of irresponsiveness on the part of people who have received for so long a period such grievous and slow healing wounds. So the reason I'm sharing this quote is these are the words of the guardian that has given me the ability to understand what is the behavior, the attitude, the, the, the kind of presence I need to have around people of African descent? To be people that have not been, you know, because I often hear people say, like Persian Baha'is even say, or white people say, some of them say, but what do they want? What can I do? But they want what you have. They want to be respected. They want to be loved. They want their culture to be understood. They also, they are also your human family. We are fingers of one hand, what you want for yourself. They want for themselves too. They don't want any more. They don't want any handouts. Don't believe anything that you hear in the dominant news trying to say that, you know, there's a segment of the population that wants to receive and take away from the pie. No, people want to be respected, especially people of African descent who have such a um, axiology of a one-on-one, person-to-person relationship, one-on-one -on -one connection, which we are Persians are so good at. We're so good at loving. And I'm seeing beautiful Masood over here. His, thank you, my brother. He's always encouraging me. Ya Baha'u'llah Pa in this work. And it's this. Um, so um, it's this spontaneous, intimate friendships. When I pick up the phone and I speak to any of my Baha'i friends of African descent who are so happy to help me understand because, you know, you understand if, if the guardian says, first the white person needs to do this or Hoda needs to do this because in a corresponding effort, then the person of color is gonna give up this feeling of suspicion and mistrust. Why does she wanna do this? Why does she wanna ask me these questions? You know, because just like they don't know, people of African descent don't know if they're being suspicious, being suspicion or having mistrust, and if you really have a close connection with them, I found I could say, don't you think you're being a little bit suspicious? It's because we have a relationship, right? 
just the same way an Iranian woman like me, unless I have these deep, deep, deeply meaningful friendships where I'm corrected with my attitudes of superiority that shows itself in my language, in my behavior, in my centering, in my denial, in my minimization, in my turning it around, etc. That will, that's what is a real friendship. And that's where the nuggets of where I want to share on this long and thorny road, which I want, I think I, you want me to share right now. What is this long and thorny road that I've been on? So I want to share that when I first came to America, when I moved actually here in 1983, and then my husband and I got married, I moved to Florida. And um, my, the, uh, a Baha'i couple with children lived in the particular community I left. Thank God, Yabaola. And their names are Beverly and John Sneed. You just heard John Sneed's beautiful, mesmerizing voice um, early on in the devotional. And, um, and we were just having a conversation. And then uh, Beverly said to me, this was around 1990. And she says, well, here's my unconscious incompetence. That's where most all, I believe, sorry, I don't mean to speak for all Persians, but I think majority of Persians have unconscious incompetence about the issue of race and racism in America. They don't know, but you know, we could just, we could just reach out and study, Google, learn. After all, racism is the enemy of the oneness of humanity. So what do we need to know? So it's a personal responsibility. That's why it's the call of the heart. Barbara always reminds me. So, and um, Beverly said, um, we don't have race unity in our community. How are we going to promote world unity? Oh my God. When I heard that, this is my first, this is, I'm just only 24 year old in 1991. I'm 31, recently come to this community in Florida. And, and I said, I thought she was a covenant breaker. This is what I'm sharing with you. This is how an Iranian first reacts. Oh my God. Our faith is about the oneness of humanity. And you're telling me we don't have race unity in our community. Oh my God, the world has ended. Everything that I know, everything that, all the suffering, all the teachings of Baha'u'llah, the oneness of humanity, Abdul Baha is coming to America and all that. And we don't have race unity in the community. And I really literally turned red both inside and outside. And I started asking questions. Well, let's say that's the first time I got an education. That's the first time I got an education. And then, um, so I thought I really got to learn more about this. So I went, and so basically, just using the analogy of the long and thorny road, Beverly said, no entry. This is the long, wrong road. The road is over there. So, you know, you just need to kind of, you know, get yourself over there. Um, and, you know, you just got to do your own journey. And then, um, then I heard about there was a, Institute for Healing Racism. I said, I got to find out what this was. I told my husband, we had little kids. I said, I'm going to go to Dallas. I heard about this Institute for Healing Racism. I want to know what it is. So I went there and I learned of a workshop. It's the first time I ever heard about the institutionalized race-based prejudice, internalized oppression, all those things that so many of us, you know. And then I invited Cherry Steinwender. She came she literally came to Florida and she did a workshop. I will never forget her booming voice, her powerful presence, her brilliance. She stood like a mighty mountain, a torrent of information. Boom, 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 boom. And my heart was moved. And this is why, this is why when the Guardian tells Sadie Oglesby, where are the black people? If they're not there, Go find where they are. And if they're not coming, remove whatever is preventing them from coming into this faith. Because of the pupil of the eye, where the, the, through which the light of the spirit shines through. I've witnessed this from my own reality of my friendship and my close friendship with people of African descent. I've never seen people pray as much. 
I've never seen people devoted. I've never seen people know the prayers the way they see the writings from their perspective. So anyway, and then, um, so Cherry really um, changed my life. And then I served on the Race Unity Committee with Chuck uh, Edgerton and Del Campbell and Kathy Lee, who's here. And I'm so happy to see you, Kathy Lee. And, um, and then uh, later on, so this was, uh, she says, Cherry telling me, Hoda, let's heal racism. It is healable. Baha'u'llah's healing medicine will help it. On this road, get on the healing of this. And then I met an amazing woman. Um, I, we, my husband and I would constantly have uh, uh, healing racism institutes and race unity gatherings um, at our home. And, uh, and then we would say, you know, this is only about race. If you wanna to come to Baha'i gatherings, it's another separate event. And we've really focused on this. And I, she said, you gotta meet Lanise Jackson Gartner. So we invited her and she, oh my God, she was almost 400 pounds, six foot tall, a giant, a spiritual giant. And, you know, and our first encounter was awful. She pretty much slammed me. She just said, this is the best they got in this city, talking about the oneness of humanity and racism. You're it. And instead of, and this was in front of everybody. There's a hundred people there. But I didn't say, didn't take defense. I didn't go into defense posture, trying to defend myself. I said, Forgive me, I'm learning, I'm your student. I wanna learn more. I wanna be a soldier in this army. And so that became a 12 year relationship. She is, and she passed away actually 12 years ago. I met her in 1997, she passed away in uh, 20, um, Uh, 2007. And my life has never been the same. She works me from the next world. She told me, Hoda, get on the bus. That's her analogy on the long and thorny road beset with pit pitfalls. I saw how her children treated, were treated. We, we did everything together. I traveled there. She traveled over here. We, we ate together, we, we, we traveled together, we did a lot of race work together. I saw how she was treated in restaurants. I saw how, I saw how everything, how life treated her. I saw how Baha'is treated her. I saw how she was, you know, and she's my, she was my sister. She helped save my marriage. You know, Iranians were very like, you know, ten, most of us, I shouldn't generalize. I hate stereotyping, but I watch it out. We are all about being concerned about our image, how we look, you know, are we smart enough? Are we intelligent enough? Not say a word unless we have a doctorate in that. I don't believe in that stuff. This work belongs to all of us. Yeah, okay, I'm a dentist. I got light hair. Who cares? I'm still going to do this work. It's my work. So anyway, and I, so here, let me give you an example. She was in my office and in my dental office. And um, this was early on. Again, see, I, I keep deferring to the inherent subconscious feeling of sobriety. What the guardian says, I've inherited from two from nations, reading those habits, tendencies, which I, you have inherited from your nation. And I got two nations to deal with, both Iran, which has a lot of anti-blackness, because if you got kids that are light hair, you're in good shape. Ah, awesome, your kids are so light hair and beautiful. And always like, they always say, we don't have racism in Iran. That's lying. We have a 10 to 12% of the people of Iran. Um, they share their origin from Africa. The, the southern part of Iran, there's a lot of people of African descent and they're not treated the same. They are called derogatory names. They are um, not considered as equal. They are told, where are you from Africa? What? I'm not from Africa. I've been here for several generations. I'm Iranian just like you are. So, you know, there's a lot of like, you know, anti-blackness in Iran and there's a lot of anti-blackness in America. So I got to deal with those two things just constantly. I have to battle in my head and in my heart all the time. 
So, so I was in the office and a patient came in and said, where are you from? So I know the value of whiteness. Automatically, I said, I'm from, I'm Persian. Doesn't say I'm Iran. <laughs> Ding. I know how people feel about Iranians. You know, everybody knows in America. Wow, Americans, white Americans, or other Americans, think about Iranians. They call us all kinds of names. The sand in, the camel jockey, they go back home. Uh, you don't belong here. My son was born and raised here. They've called him all kinds of names, same as my husband who came here when he was 17. So when we say we don't know about anti, we don't know anything about prejudice or anti-blackness, we're lying, you know, we hear it all the time, but just because we shove it down and we push it down, we don't say anything about it. We insist that the people of African descent do the same thing, but no, you know, Persian wise, often so many of them say, you know, you know, we have, um, we have endured, we have quietly been so quietly, we've risen, we haven't said anything, we don't protest, we don't get on the street, we don't, we don't burn cars, you know, um, because what they're doing with the Baha to the Baha'is in Iran. And I said, because Baha'is is a sacrifice of the altar of the oneness of humanity. People of African descent are jacked up in America every single day for generations. And their kids will continue to be so in generations because of the doctrine of white supremacy. That's the difference. That's why we have to protest. That's why we have to speak up. You know. So anyway, um, so going back to Lenise and the story, she's telling me how to finish the story. So I am. Uh, I said, I'm Persian, but I was brought up and raised in England. And then she had a conversation with me, just like my dear friend Barbara does when I say something stupid and racist. And she says, do you know that your ancestors are turning in their grave when you're denying your cultural heritage? So that was a good lesson for me. So anyway, um, she really, Lenise really, um, saved my life, saved my family's life. Because, you know, Iranians, we don't, unfortunately, we don't share often our most difficult things because we don't, we don't want to unveil. But we don't realize, but by revealing, we heal. With my friends of African descent, I talk about everything, about my challenges, about my kids, about my marriage, my family, my, my, Black sisters know everything about me, you know, because there's trust. There's, and this is what Black America wants from white America, your competence, your staying in the ring, like Barbara says, your authenticity, your being honest with your own weaknesses and your pathology of say, racism, sexism, classism. Um, and if you have these, these qualities um, of competence, reliability, and intimacy, then you will, you'll have my trust. So anyway, um, and then, so that was being on Lenise's bus for 12 years. And when she passed away, a piece of me died and is still dead. Um, and um, then comes this, uh, the pandemic. And I had known um, Barbara Talley. These are deep friendships. This is, this is why I am who I am and I do what I do because it's not through learning all these books that you see over here. I don't read, I read these books, yeah. But I spend a lot more time having real conversations with my friends about things that matter, that, can, that I can speak up in my spaces that I have so they will be informed of their, of their issues. And COVID-19 was the best thing that happened to me because my office closed down for four months. So I really had time to be in spaces like Foundation Hall University, which is an amazing place, the architect of which is Barbara Talley, who put so much time and energy for hours on end, white people and African-American people and large numbers of African-American people for three, four, five hours we're talking about the issue of race and reading the writings and reading the guidance. It was a space for 
deep friendship, consultation, communication, studying the guidance, learning what it means to center the pupil of the eye, what it looks like to deep dive in hours of conversation and having deep ongoing friendships that has daily, I spend daily hours just, I call Barbara, I said, Barbara, just can you please, I'm really stuck on this. Or it's just, she just helps me understand because she, she knows I care. She knows she, she knows it's not because of, of an ego issue. I'm not ego. I just have a vested interest, vested interest to share my Iranian Baha'i brothers and sisters who demographically are outnumbering all other ethnic groups in so many Baha'i communities. And we know that prejudice plus power equals racism. And when you have so many Iranians in a given community, which do with which defer to the same habit and tendencies. When I see you, I don't see your color. I love you. I don't, you know. Um, but why are you so angry? Why are you so loud? Why are you? Why? Um, why? What is it that you want? Um, can you please be a little bit kinder? Can you please word, use word mild as milk? Can you please just um, uh, please? Can I talk about my oppression? Can you know the Baha'is in Iran are also persecuted? Can we talk about that? No, this is not about us Persians. The work of race unity is to uplift, inspire, and, and center the people of the eye just as Abdul Baha did. And I'm grateful for all these sp spaces that has been created by the movement of the people of the eye ah, in the past year and a half. And they are like generals. And I'm just a little bitty soldier trying to learn as much as I can so I can just do whatever I can to. And that's, I was encouraged to start. Somebody asked a question, an African-American, James Williams in Foundation Hall University. Hold up, what are the Persians doing collectively to promote the oneness of humanity and to address the most vital and challenging issue? I didn't sleep that night. I called Barbara, I said, Barbara, how about we start a Facebook group, group called Iranian Baha'is for Racial Justice and invite everybody in there and let whites, blacks, Persians, everybody in with the sole purpose of wanting to educate, inspire, uplift, and center the people of the eye while educating the Persian Baha'is. And so that's, that's what I'm doing. And I'm done now. I want to hear everybody else talk. <laughs> Thank you so much. Wow. I feel so inspired um, with your story. And I think that I've taken so much and learned from your example. And you're inspiring me to um, get into more spaces as, um, as this work continues and to engage in different spaces to learn more and also to ask more questions because I think you know, oftentimes we see different people in spaces, we see them doing the work, but we don't really take the time to get to know their journey and understand um, what their inspiration is and really what those pivotal moments are um, in people's lives that help them and push them along, um, along this road or this path, as we call it. And so friends, um, Hoda, do you think this is, would be a good time to um, invite the friends to ask questions? Okay, all right. Um, so I see Barbara Talley. I figured I'd get in here quicker. <laughs> but I have to just say, I am so very proud of you. Um, this was amazing. It was heartfelt. And you know, if there was something wrong, I would I wouldn't probably tell you in this form, but I would say, uh, Hoda, Hoda, Hoda. <laughs> and we'd have that. She knows when I she say- She calls me hound dog Hoda. <laughs> in a loving way. <laughs> I said, cause Hoda was like, are you on this call? I'm like, Hoda, no. You know, I said, if there is a race call out there, you will find it. Are you on this? I'm like, Hoda, I can't be on all of those things. So, but Hoda, you know, uh, I just want to just commend you because you are in it. And you know, as I'll say, you're in the ring. You're in the ring. I don't want people as bystanders sitting in the, out there watching the fight and saying, oh, boy, she should have punched left or she should have ducked or 
maybe let's give her some water. Let's push some bandages under the, the, the ring there. I want you in the ring. I want you in the ring blocking the punches. I want you in the ring and you are in the ring. You're in the ring. You know, uh, one thing you said when you, as I always say, the need of the cause in America is the call of the heart. Your heart calls, hon. You do that. You said, I don't do that. But no, I want to correct you here. You do that. Your heart calls out so loudly, so clearly. The need of the cause in America is the call of the heart that can be given no one. It was 